This edition of Tech Talk is brought to you in part by Telex, the interconnection company, owners and operators of 56 Marietta, the most networked rich co-location facility in the southeast. Tag TV and Tag Radio. Technology now has a voice of innovation and information. Get it on www.tagtvonline.com. Advance business communications in the new economy to enable, even encourage, user-focused communication events like collaboration, mobility, customer contact, business intelligence, and a solid technology foundation to run tailored applications unique to each business operation. Properly treated, communications can be one of an organization's most important strategic weapons, not only to drive efficiency, but to effectively differentiate itself in a world of competition. Greetings, everyone. It's Tuesday, June 2nd, 2009, and this is Tech Talk with Technology Association of Georgia President Tino Mantella. I'm your guest host, Frank Baia. Today's Tech Talk, embracing new communication technology while still managing the risk involved in change. Advanced communication from the design process to ensuring solutions that are robust and secure. How to introduce advanced technology in a seamless fashion and the challenges businesses face in the cutting-edge world of advanced communication environments. Up to the Tech Talk, Graham Clark, Vice President, Southeast Operations for TouchBase USA, the operating company of TouchBase Global here in the States. TouchBase Global is the world's leading specialized services company, helping mid-sized, multi-regional, and multinational companies optimize business communications. Graham brings some quarter century of global experience in Europe, Asia, and the Americas across multiple industries, but always focused on customer interaction and customer experience. His stellar career spans such highlights as team member that developed ITIL in London, over a decade spent between Capgemini and Ernst Young in Europe and in the United States, then for four years owner of contact center, excuse me, contract centers and field sales and service applications and infrastructure at the former Bell South. More than a proven professional, Graham is also a successful investor and entrepreneur, providing startup capital and expertise, and is currently serving on the board of six companies. An active member of TAG, Graham has chaired the Customer Relations Management Society for the past four years. The Tech Talk is on business communications, technologies, trends, and hot topics. More crucially important than ever to build a success, albeit to provide sheer survival of today's organizations with one of the world's top industry experts, VP Southeast U.S. for TouchBase, TAG's own Graham Clark. Graham, welcome to Tech Talk. Hi, Frank. Pleasure to be here. Boy, i got to tell you, communications, it's going crazy. I know that for most people it's probably too hectic, and everybody talks about it being uh, you know, too frantic as far as too many ways of getting connected. And then, of course, we've got all the social marketing and new approaches, Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of thing. I guess we'll start with uh, probably the most fundamental question you get asked, and that is why should, say, technology and business executives focus on business communication technology? So, um, you know, the, the, the business communications technology, which includes um, everything from, uh, you know, Twitter to instant messaging to email, which is probably the most uh, popular form of technology in the developed world, um, to the new wave of technologies, voice over IP, telecommunications, video conferencing. Um, the, those technologies have, have been uh, emerging in, in their current formulation for about, well, you could say for 100 years, but have really been changing over the last 15 years or so, probably starting with AOL instant messaging. Um, and in the enterprise today, the, the um, confluence of those technologies and especially their interoperability across manufacturing platforms is allowing companies to revolutionize the way they do business, um, whether it's a, a major corporation who 10 to 15 years ago would enter a new market by effectively buying a building and sticking their name on the top. Um, you know, we have many clients that are now entering new markets by sticking uh, two people in a rented office space in Sichuan province in China and uh, exploring that new marketplace with highly mobile employees with very, very uh, light infrastructure supporting them but allowing those employees to participate in their global business enterprise just as if they were sitting in a major building back in the United States or in London or in Paris or in Sydney or in Tokyo. So 
the new wave of business communications infrastructures is really being used by many companies as a significant competitive weapon to change the way they operate um, and to change the way that their employees communicate with their clients and with each other and with their business partners. And it's not just efficiency anymore. I mean, obviously, that's still a crucial factor. It's got a lot to do with collaboration and and uh, even commerce, for that matter. Uh, one of the things that uh, you hear a lot about buzzwords now are things like clouds and mesh connecting and, you know, the numbers of different kinds of approaches. And a lot of that is coming out of Cisco with telepresence and some of the things they're playing around with with now having bought WebEx. When we're dealing with technology manufacturers like Cisco and Microsoft and IBM, uh, why would a company want to, say, deal with TouchBase as a specific question? I mean, I know your company. Tell us a little bit about TouchBase and why TouchBase versus some of these bigger players. So, so, so TouchBase is an interesting company. I, I've been with us for about 18 months. Um, we're, we're a 17-year-old company originally founded in London, and, and we, we grew the business to about a $200 million business by 2006, and then... Uh, Took a fairly radical direction shift. We were a we were a technology a global technology integrator, predominantly uh, working in Europe, Asia, and Australia. We really didn't operate in the United States. And in 2006, we decided to do three things. One is we decided to broaden our technology portfolio to to be less of a uh, albeit high powered value added reseller. Uh, and more of a, a general uh, integrator. The second is that we added a portfolio of, of strategy and business case services that we refer to as our Discover portfolio. And the third is we really wanted to come to North America because in order to be a uh, in order to be a real global player, you have to play here. So sure. we sold our old business. We uh, reset the counter to zero. And since the end of 2006, in about 30 months, we've grown from zero to about 100 million in revenue, zero to 250 people, and zero to about 20 offices around the world. Mm. So our clients come to us, which we think validates that we did the right thing. You know, I was just um, going to ask that question, though. I mean, is it a case where there's enough understanding and knowledge? I mean, you know, obviously the one of the political cliches right now is this line about a, a – uh, um, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And in today's economy, you've got a lot of consolidation that's going on. Obviously, they're looking to cut costs and be more efficient. Are they looking for you? Do they know this kind of technology exists? And, or is it a case where you've got to be out there proactively marketing it? Uh, all of the above. What, what we tend to find is our, you know, uh, our success in life is all about complexity. So um, the companies that are being the most, our clients that are being the most successful with these technologies are, are using multiple manufacturers' technologies. So one of the things that changed a couple of years ago, right, when we changed our strategy and not totally unlinked, um, is that most of the major manufacturers, the IBMs, the Cisco's, the Microsoft's, stopped believing they were going to own everything and decided they were going to have to work together. So hmm. if a client goes to their manufacturer's reps, you know, manufacturer's reps are paid, they're compensated to sell more of the stuff that they advocate. Um, very few manufacturer's reps are paid to sell their competitor's stuff, um, and very few of those manufacturers will necessarily be experts in or are compensated to even sell stuff that plugs together with theirs to make the client more effective. So the the communications technology world has become much more complex, and, and yet clients can rarely call on the traditional major consulting companies in order to help them solve these problems, either because most of the major systems integrators and consulting companies have very small groups that focus on business communications infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of the biggest brand names that you would expect to see, the IBMs, the Accentures, the Deloitte's, the Capgeminis, where I worked, Ernst & Young, um, who are phenomenal companies, most of those companies are purpose-built to deal with the global 500. They come down market sometimes, um, but what we saw was a huge gap in uh, service companies built to deal with this revolution that's going on in business communications infrastructure that affects every single function across an enterprise, but built to do that using proven solutions to focus on companies. Most of our clients are in the $1 to 2 to $3 billion revenue marketplace, but most of those companies are increasingly global, whether it's because their manufacturing and supply is, is, is working offshore, mm -hmm. whether it's because their customers are global, whether it's because they're using diverse business partnerships with other global companies. Increasingly, a billion-dollar company is going to operate in a dozen or more countries, and there just wasn't the service community to help those people leverage this revolution, which was afoot. So that's why we changed our focus. That's why we designed the company. It's purpose-built to work with those companies. And uh, and we've got about, um, about 150 clients across the world that appreciate that. 
So, uh, and again, I, I mean, I, it's, it, when you explain it the way you just did, it's pretty obvious that, that there is a lot of, of uh, push demand, not just, well, pull as well. I mean, when you're talking about a global ERP footprint and you're dealing with a lot of cross-electronic interchange anyway, your communications better be up to speed. How do, how do, how do, you, do you guys play well when you talk about Cisco and Microsoft and IBM and actually a touch base, you know, where does that, how does that work? Does a, you know, is it a case where you guys are, you know, uh, so let's say, for example, an SAP is uh, into, uh, um, say, a McKesson. Uh, does that, how, how would you break into something like that? Would that be a case where they would come through their Capgemini relationship and be pushing for some kind of mesh connecting communication and then you'd somehow or another be brought in from an expertise level? Or I'm just curious about how you break into even business that's uh, identified as target market. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, well, a lot of different questions. <laughs> questions. So, well, um, I'm really fascinated is how well you guys play together. I mean, it would well, seem like there would be a little bit of a crossover in some cases. Right. Nice, nice reference to that target target company, which is a customer of ours. So, um, so, so one of the there are a number of uh, philosophical principles we operate on. One of them is that you know you can't be any good at anything if you try to be good at everything. So, mm. um, we don't do what SAP does, although there's a little bit of SAP's work that interlap, overlaps with us. So, so we set up a portfolio of global partnerships with the like of Microsoft, with the like of IBM, with the likes of Cisco. Um, we then work in environments like SAP. We have about 40 or 50 customers globally that are that use SAP as their core ERP technology, um, and about half of those customers actually use SAP in their CRM technology arena. So um, we are always working in environments where many other companies work, and so one of our guiding guiding philosophies is the idea of being a partner's partner. So even in the even in the core technology that we focus on, we're really focused on helping clients with the this new emerging world of enterprise applications that support business communication. So even if you took like a company like Cisco and you said a company in order to do this has to establish a, a, a reliable, secure, high bandwidth, high availability global network, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to include wireless components, it's going to include telecommunications companies it's going to include a solid network at the router level. And so even in Cisco world, where we're a very strong global partner in the enterprise applications, we'll usually partner with hardcore Cisco network partners in order to have them do, do the core network work or with a, a telecommunications company like a British Telecom or a Verizon or an AT&T. So there's always a multitude of companies working with any particular project initiative we do with clients. And so we've developed a, an incredible culture of being a partner's partner with those people rather than trying to fight with them. Now let's talk a little bit maybe about technology trends and topics. Uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, we used to say fluidity, then we said dynamic fluidity, exponential growth. I heard phantasmagoric now is the new term as far as how rapidly things are changing. Maybe if you would take a risk for a minute and talk about the top three business communication technology trends and topics that your clients are talking about globally right now. Right now, yeah, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very fast moving world. Um, I, I sometimes uh, one of the most amazing things about the business communications world is is around the the consumerization of the enterprise, right? Which uh, which leads us to one of the interesting topics, which is probably not the the biggest thing on our clients' mind, but it's certainly an area of interest where we get a lot of attention from our our clients on some, some, some kind of thought leadership we've taken, which is around the, the dramatic change in the enterprise, which is being driven by the iPhone, <coughs> right? Which is, as I said, not going to be the world's most revolutionary thing, but when your CEO walks into a boardroom or into your executive meeting carrying one because his or her daughter just bought him one for, his or her one for their birthday, then you're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. So, um, you know, there's a there's a brand new wave of consumer technology, whether it's your your Twitters or your Facebooks or your iPhones coming to coming to companies, which are really kind of driving both the employees' belief in what they should be able to use, um, and also the capabilities that are being required to to do business because other companies are using those capabilities. So there's there's certainly kind of this this consumerization wave, and how do you leverage those capabilities while maintaining the security and reliability of your enterprise network, and and, and allowing people to be as flexible in their working environment as they sh as they want to be, which sometimes is more than they should be, but mm -hmm. that's not an option. Um, in line with that, and I'll put these both in the same camp. There's actually a fairly interesting impact of those considerations on the workforce of the future. So a lot of companies are 
using this economic turmoil that we're in to basically start retooling for their next generation of workers. And, and we see a lot of companies whose HR people are saying they're bringing people in for interviews, they're, you know, they're, they're bringing in the 20, 30-somethings that they want to arm their company for the next 30 years of growth. And those people are taking one look at the old communications technology they're using in the company and telling them that they're not interested. You know, it's funny, uh, I had an opportunity to meet uh, with some high-end uh, academics at one of the best uh, art and design schools around in the nation, and they were saying that the biggest challenge they had with their graduates was just what you're saying. They've come out of an environment with advanced technologies and advanced communication capabilities, and they go to a job, and they really don't know how to use the equipment because it's antiquated. You know, so. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, 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 you know, I don't think I had to validate your point, but there's a perfect instance just in the last couple of weeks where I was talking about that problem. Talk a little bit about cultural acceptance, though. When you're talking about this much change, do you guys get involved in how this stuff gets implemented and how it gets accepted within a, a corporate culture that has been rutted in a particular kind of communications? We, we, we do. I'll throw back to one other one other major technology trend and then talk a little bit about, about how we get involved in these things. So. Um, so we're also uh, right in the middle of, you know, the collaboration uh, revolution that's going on. So our, our life is all about customer contact enablement, mobility, and collaboration. So mm -hmm. the mobility and collaboration topics, again, you know, we're seeing um, a lot of companies using collaboration technology, video collaboration technology. I mean, you mentioned Cisco's telepresence, which they adore and is kind of a luxury um, and probably most high-powered technology out in the marketplace with it with a price tag to boot. Mm -hmm. um, but it has phenomenal benefits for the people who are using it well. So, you know, we're seeing companies across the world slashing their travel and expense budgets. You know, they're taking 20, 30, 40 percent off those travel budgets. They're slashing their employee bases, and they're trying to figure out, which we're helping them with, how they can do the same business with 30 percent less people and 30 to 50 percent less travel budget. And so. They're really using, again, they're using the economic turmoil as a, an excuse to some extent to drive a change in the way they do business. And they're finding that, um, you know, when you take the average employee traveling across, the, even just within the United States, traveling across the United States for a business meeting, you know, they're typically investing six to eight hours in order to get to and from that business meeting for what might be a 30 to 45 minute business meeting. And, and if they're flying across the country, they may be investing 16 to 18 hours. Um, so well, you I'd, want to I'd, sure. submit, I'd submit too that I mean obviously that 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 argument is extremely important, especially in these kind of economic times. But I would think in the evolution of just pure competitiveness, time matters. Right. I mean the ability to instantly connect, to instantly collaborate, to have it be a almost engaging the now on a consistent basis has got to play a role as much as the cost of travel. Absolutely. Well, and not only instantly connect, but instantly connect with the right person. So it does you no good to have somebody come sit yeah. in front of you who doesn't have the knowledge base. So, so what we're seeing is just like just like email and the internet have allowed people to engage with other professionals across the world to get things done. We're now seeing the ability to bring video technology, whether it's as simple as seeing somebody's face. Um, we we were at a demo about two weeks ago from a company that's creating a plug-in that will analyze a video conference stream, link it to your contact book within Outlook, and then automatically populate the name of the person based on facial recognition. And not that's going to change anybody's world instantaneously, but it gives you some idea as to the kind of things that are going on. So we're seeing our clients sitting back and saying, again, if I've removed 30% of my people, <coughs> and while some of those people are going to be you know, top performers who get caught up in the wave in general, what companies are doing is they're removing layers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so as we start to see expansion in front of us, we're seeing a lot of companies coming to us and saying, you know what, we think the bottom is here. Probably get hung up to dry for that statement sometime six months from now, but we think the bottom is here in terms of the worst of the shrinkage. We think we're going to stabilize for the next three to six months, and then we think we're going to see growth, and we may be even seeing growth in Eastern Europe, in China, mm -hmm. in India, in Asia, in, some, in South America. We want to step up to that growth highly competitively. We're not hiring the 30% of people back. You know, we'd love to think we were, but we're not going to. We want to figure out how we can double our revenues with only increasing our people 10 to 20%. And we think this communications capability and the ability to link an ever-decreasing number of highly talented and highly capable people across the world with the customers, with the business partners, and with the other employees that need to be working with those people in order to be effective without flying those people around the world in our private Learjet. We think cracking that nut 
has been something we've been looking to do for 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 years. And the only way the capabilities existed 10, 20 years ago was if you were one of the biggest multinationals and you could afford to spend hundreds of millions of dollars putting that together. Well, the reason we're successful and the reason our clients are successful is because the last five years or even the last two years has resulted in those solutions being packagized in such a way mm -hmm. that a billion-dollar company can afford those, not just a $100 billion company. Well, and, and again, I, we could go on. I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. There's a couple of quick questions I want to still throw yeah. at you. But, you know, I I kind of preach to my people that, that you invest in the inevitable. And if you look out, like you say, whether it's six months or a year, what is the new economy going to look like in two or three years or five years? And will it ever go back? No, it's not going to go back. And how it's going to go forward is pretty clear the way you're describing it. So, again, this issue about the economy being a ter you know, the uh, a crisis being a terrible thing to waste, I think what we are seeing is a leapfrog of opportunity and acceptance of innovation in ways that uh, I hadn't seen in the last decade and for, from my small perspective. Um, you were going to touch just real quick on culture and cultural acceptance. I mean, when you're talking about bringing in, you know, generation whatever it is, X, Y, Z, or in, in uh, 30-somethings that are totally wired, that's one thing. But what do you do when you've got an established, you know, say, sales force or an a, uh, employee force that's kind of used to the old ways of doing things? Um, the, the, there are two real answers to that. One is plan for it carefully. So uh, if you look at our service portfolio, kind of uh, shameless advertising, you know, we, we front our services with these, with these planning services that we call Discover. And, and unlike your typical consulting company, it takes three months and $300,000 to come up with a PowerPoint. You know, we do that very quickly and very, uh, very aggressively. You know, we, we, do, we do discover workshops with clients for $5,000. We do full-blown strategy sessions with clients in five to six weeks for fifty to 60000 And we'll actually uh, share the risk with our clients so that you know, they pay us half up front and they only pay us the other half if they like what we do. No, if they like what we do. If they don't like it, we don't argue. They just don't pay us. Um, so I no, think that's cultural brilliant. acceptance. That's brilliant. I mean, that, that's uh, it's very different. Yeah. Well, I mean, in order to embrace these kind of changes and to deal with the realities, I think you got to take them a little bit out to where uh, they can establish some trust and get a little right. bit of time to understand. Listen, uh, this has been great. I, I'm sorry, so sorry that we ran out of time. This is a subject that is near and dear to us over here. But uh, obviously, you've got a, a, a great thing going. We've been talking to Graham Clark. He's the vice president of the Southeast United States for TouchBase. And Graham, uh, I can't thank you enough, not only for joining us here to, today on Tech Talk, but for your great insights about, uh, let's say, uh, the inevitable and how much you're doing to make all of that happen. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Frank.